Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and today we're going to go over Pathfinder 2E. Just a quick initial look at the books and the things that have really jumped out to me on the first day. Um, before we get any further along, I want to make sure that everyone understands right off the bat, there's not a review of the game. There's no way you can review the game on the first day that it's come out. you got to play it. you got to read the whole rule book. you got to get together with the people who know the rules, make characters, play some adventures, really play it. And I'm going to do that. But there's a lot of really cool things I found in day one that really excited me. And let's go through it. Let's get, go ahead and get started on that. So right off the bat, one of the things that, you know, everyone has been waiting all this time to get their hands on the physical copies. Mine came at like 1230 today. But earlier today, uh, we all know that Gen Con uh, kicked off at 10 a.m. this morning. And from in my time zone, from like 11 to 1, they had a, uh, a Twitch stream. It was really cool, actually. Uh, the Twitch stream had uh, Jason and some of the other designers on the team, and they kind of talked about the first hour was an introduction to the game. And the second hour was, uh, you know, kind of like, let's build a character. And they made it very comedic and funny. They built like a goblin bard. It was totally hilarious. Um, there is a lot of things in this edition that I'm really excited about, and I want to talk you through that. I wanna, I'm going to pull up a shot of the actual uh, of the actual book itself. I want to go through just the introductory section, and I'm not going to read you the book. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what I think of it, because remember, I'm a video game designer, right? I was a kid who grew up playing Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 40, 41 years ago. I grew up with the, what you know some people call it first edition, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. I played second. I played third. I played fourth a little bit when I was in Europe. I played fifth. No, not really. I bought it, tried it some, but that's when I started doing this channel. So the goal of the video today is to give you kind of an initial thoughts from my perspective. I'm not run-of-the-mill hardcore D and D player that's been doing Roll Twenty for five years. I'm just a different, an older dude who's been playing games for a long time and has huge respect for what these guys have done. And I'm in the process of doing converting my module I wrote earlier this year over to this edition after I learn it. So the purpose of the video is to give you my initial thoughts and the things that jumped out at me because there's some things in the first chapter that I'm really, really excited about that I think are very, very cool. So let's just get right into it right away. So let's get these books out of the way. So I'll just leave the beast chair here in the background just for fun, and let's throw these kids in here. So if you're playing the Hidden Shrine to Moishan, it's the first room, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at the right-hand side here. Right off the bat, you know, Wayne Reynolds is one of the artists that's been doing stuff with these guys for a long time. I'm a creative director in the game industry. I interact with animators, programmers, level designers. I was a level designer myself. Concept artists all the time. Um, occasionally a producer, but you don't really need one if you don't really want. But the one thing I do in my job on a day-to-day -day basis with video games and MMOs and everything else is you have to have an artistic eye. You have to have an eye to tell if something's good or not. You don't necessarily are the person that's running around telling people what to do. You're giving people kind of loose direction they can take and put their own personal twist on it. Every single time these guys put together one of their books, or even one of their blogs, the artwork is fantastic. There is a lot of people that have done art in this book. So one thing a lot of people do is they just skip right over everything and they forget that the effort behind this thing is by done by people. I mean, you've got uh, four primary people have given credit on this. Logan Bonner, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, Jason Bullman, um, Stephen Rodney McFarland, and Mark uh, Seifter, I believe he pronounced his name. I haven't met any of these people. I'm connected with Jason on LinkedIn, but that happens a lot. And James Jacob doing the digital writing. But look at the staff of people, the developers, the editors, the cover artist is Wayne Reynolds. Look at the interior art list. I mean, if you go through every one of these people's names, and I encourage you to do this, go through the people's names in this art list right like there's one fellow down here i'm, pro I'm not sure how to pronounce his name it's sedevan lee or sedevan lee uh, or alay he look at his website go look this guy up on the web these people the artists the art is absolutely fantastic i really 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 love what they've done with the art now the problem is when you're using contract artists all around the world and we do this in a video game industry all the time you've got to have an art director an art direction a graphic design direction which is sarah robinson and sonia morris in this case have done a fantastic job of making sure there's a level of consistency they already established kind of a brand look and feel even with the miniatures that they've created um, for the whole Pathfinder 1 series. They have signature characters. They have a signature look. They have a, the way the characters appear. Everything and all their stuff has a look. And they've really established kind of this brand that uh, um, is consistent. So be sure, if you're a gamer, learn the rules. Yes, play the game. Fantastic. There's plenty of people that will tell you how to play the game. I'll do something like that eventually. But I want you to remember that these are just regular people who poured their whole life into doing this stuff. And, you know, there's all kinds of, there's a publisher, Eric Bonus, the publisher, there's a creative director, which is James Jacobs. There's a huge group of people involved in putting this together. And it's really good. 
<laughs> it's really well done. In my mind, when I got the play test, I was like, wow, this is going to be really tricky because the first edition of Pathfinder is really kind of a an expansion to 3.5. It's an OGL, lots of new classes and villains and codexes, and they're really shining as a publisher, creating tons and tons of beautiful content. I mean, if you, you could never play it all. It would take you 15,000 years to play all the amazing content. But then, it comes time to do the second edition. What are they going to do? You know, you got fifth edition that had come out and try to streamline things. It really changed a lot from fourth edition. It's not the same as three, third edition. They try to go back to their roots. It's drawing a different kind of crowd. Pathfinder was very complex. So Pathfinder 1 players may or may not transition over immediately, but I encourage you to give it a shot. So if you like Advanced Dungeons & Dragons and you like Pathfinder and you like 3.5 and you like OGL and D20 stuff, I encourage you to grab a copy of this book. And here's what you can do. You can obviously buy a copy of the hardbacks, which I have, um, from Amazon. They cost less on Amazon, but you can get them from Paizo directly. Um, it costs a little bit more to get them from Paizo. Um, you can do a subscription model at Paizo where you buy a book and you get a PDF, if I'm not mistaken. It's a little complicated. I haven't quite figured that out yet. You can subscribe to something and get a, a reduced price or a discount. I'll have to dig into that and learn about it. I don't know how that works just yet. Um, but you can get the PDF versions. So on the right-hand side here, you can get a PDF copy, an official PDF, not some pirated garbage. That's crap. Anyone who does that go straight to hell. Um, so, you know, 14 bucks. I mean, it's like fourteen ninety five for a PDF. For it's like a 700-some-odd page book. This, I mean, it's like hundreds of thousands of man hours of work has gone in this thing. Okay, so when you look at this spread, you're like, okay, it's a role-playing game book. Another really thick, big, meaty, these guys make books all the time. This is not going to be a surprise. We're not going to be caught flat-footed, right? But there's something about here that's really different. There's some core things that have been organized in the game that are very, very different with the ancestries and backgrounds that you see as chat section two. Obviously classes, skills, and feats won't be a huge surprise to people. Um, spells won't be a huge surprise to people. What's happened since the previous era in their world mythology, I think it's 10 years later in their Galarian world. So they have this age of lost omens. They got to talk about playing a game and game mastering because parts of the chapters of the book are tailored towards different types of people. So you have an audience number one that's like, oh, I know everything about Pathfinder one. Please don't bore me to death. Give me the dirty details. Think of people like, I played 5th edition a little bit. I know a little bit about D&D. Or they watch Critical Role or whatever they're doing. You know, and they want to check into it. So this got the way that you write something to be interesting to a new audience. Compelling and deep enough to a hardcore audience. That's like at Gen Con right now. And at the same time, not insulting to anyone's intelligence. It's very difficult to write that way. You either come off as condescending or you come off as too rudimentary. Um, so the writing and the language and the editor, um, one of the editors was on the um, stream this earlier today at, at Gen Con, you know, you have to get a lot of credit. So let's just go jump right into this, right? The introduction section. If you do anything, if you do anything at all, buy this PDF and read chapter one. It's only like 28, 31 pages or something because right there will give you an idea of what's really actually different. And so in some ways, when I'm talking about what my initial thoughts are for this video, it's not giving a review. I'm gonna tell you my opinion as somebody who's been playing D&D for over 41 years and loves this stuff. I mean, it shaped my career in the video game industry to tell you the truth. I mean, some of the levels I built in Unreal, like Chisra and Ceremony, were inspired by the Hidden Shrine of Tomoashan. What? How cool is that, right? So reading this first 28 pages, talking to someone, reading maybe the ancestry section a little bit, you'll get a real strong sense of what's different in this version. And it's a really, really interesting, it's real refined. It's kind of like, you know, I'm a long-winded guy. If I could say it in less words, I'd be really good at it, right? So without saying it in less words and dumbing it down, they've been succinct or they've been concise, but they aren't being so concise that it becomes scientifically a blur. It's very hard to do that. So let's just jump right into that section. I want to go over some of the stuff pretty quickly here. The introduction section, you know, every RPG has to do this. What's a role-playing game? How does the game work? You know, what do you do in the game? All these types of things. One of the things that's really interesting here is it takes less than two or three columns for us to already start getting into the basics of the game. So that's one thing that's really, really difficult for people to understand is like when you're writing um, a book like this and you've got to introduce the game, if you can do it in one to two pages and you're already getting into cool things like on the right hand side, creating a narrative. And, you know, I'm a guy who I've written a novel. It took me 11 years. I put so much energy in writing Iron Will Rust. Yeah, I learned so much about storytelling doing it. Page one and two, I know what PCs are, you know what DCs are, you know what levels are, you know what this is, you know what that is. Creating a narrative, let's remind ourselves what this interactive form of gaming is all about. So that's one thing right off the bat to me, 
that really helps define what everything really, really is. Um, so they really kind of define this really, really quickly to you, right? So let's just go into this next section here. You start talking about playing the game. This two pages here, okay, was a majority of what today's uh, uh, Twitch stream kind of covered, uh, kind of covered a little bit. Let me just reduce this to size a little bit so it fits a little bit better. I'm going to put this down to 65 and see if that'll work. That'll work. So this first I think it's pages uh, uh, page 10 and 11, right? Talking about playing the game. They have these uh, new ways of playing the game. And in fact, before we go any further, let's just back up a little second. Page 6. Is it page 6 on the PDF or page 8? Here we go. Okay, here we go. Playing the game. So they've broken the game up into three modes. Uh, exploration mode, an encounter mode, and a downtime mode, which I think is quite interesting. When you first play D and D, you're having to stretch and compress time. You know, one melee round used to be 60 seconds, and then you had a turn, which is 10 minutes, and you have a day, and all this kind of stuff. So what they're doing now is they're kind of dividing the gameplay up into okay, now this is a downtime section, and, and we're playing the game. This is a encounter, which is a fight, a combat scenario, a tactical situation. This is the exploration section. So you can see how you use different types of skills and different types of abilities in different types of situations, right? So the fact that they've clearly kind of defined that out means someone could actually create an adventure like the one I have working on right now, which is exploration. Like one whole day of playing the game might be exploration. When you play a video game or an MMO, sometimes you log in and you just go explore and check out new stuff. You do a little combat, but you're really there to go do something else. Or you go into an auction house and selling things or collecting rare mounts or whatever you're doing. So the fact they've really kind of spelled out, you know, exploration and encounters, uh, to me, it, and it, downtime, which is on the, following, on the following page here, is really, 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 really smart. Because I think a lot of people who never really have played um, D&D can just imagine it being like, Diablo on a tabletop, and that's not what it is at all. So there's a, another element here that I want to make sure that's really, really clear that's on that previous page. Let's jump back. This page 10 is probably one of the most powerful, 10, 11, I'm talking the two most powerful pages of the whole first chapter, okay? You know, they talk about this left-hand side. We're talking about this area about right here, right? We start talking about difficulty checks. If you started playing 4th edition and you've been playing 5th edition, you Probably never heard of a DC before. This is from 3.5 and 3rd edition of Dungeons & Dragons. Difficulty checks are like a number to beat, okay? So it used to be saving throw versus rod, paralyzation, death magic, and all this kind of business, and breath weapons. So over the years, it turned into kind of like a system of checks, something that Traveler did a long, long time ago. So they brought back, you know, this difficulty check type of system, but they've defined what they call a critical success and a critical failure. And this is something a lot of people have kind of homebrewed over the years. Even I have something for a critical failure. I call it a fumble or a flub. They're calling it a fumble. If I understand this correctly, and make sure it's, it's if I made a mayor, someone can point it out. Basically, let's say you had some kind of DC check. It's like, you need to roll a 10, right? If you roll a 20, that's 10 greater than what you needed. That means it's a critical success. That doesn't mean hitting someone. It can mean doing anything any of the actions in the game, using a skill, any kind of check that requires you to roll a d20. If you get higher than 10 than what you need, you've done it like so amazing. It's like an absolute perfect three-pointer, nothing but net from the half-court line, right? Or you do a critical failure, which is something very, really bad has happened, like the worst possible failure you could possibly have. So another element about this I think is very cool. It's kind of clearly defined. And there's another element that I thought was really, really exciting is they include the good old-fashioned... Um, a 20 always crits and a 1 always drops the ball. And that's something that you probably heard me do a lot when I was doing a, the classic DM runs through the Steading of the Hill Giant Chief and the Glacial Rift or Frost Giant Jarl. Is, I think it's really important for that 5% chance, no matter what happens on either end of the spectrum, for things to go incredibly good or incredibly bad, right? Um, another thing we want to talk about here is they've... Uh, you know, as you level up the character and you get higher and higher uh, to hits and different modifiers are happening, they have these three levels of what they're calling proficiencies. I'm probably not explaining this as well as I could, but the proficiency system is interesting now because now there's these five ranks. Um, that's going to be on this section right about here, right? Just this one little paragraph talks about proficiency systems. Um, there's untrained, which means you don't, almost like in Traveler, they had like you have no skill in using an assault weapon, right, or in back suit. Untrained, trained, expert, mastery, master, and legendary. So each one of those has a bonus, either no bonus or two, four, six, and eight. So it's kind of exponentially expanding by a factor of two. It's not really exponential. So 
the higher you get in different proficiencies with something, and some character classes are going to start off with a higher level, like a trained or expert or master level proficiency in music. Maybe the bard starts with higher in certain skills than others, and your um, backgrounds and things like that may have a huge impact on how you start. So you may start the game off with your ancestry and background has already kind of given you a boost and a head start. And you can hear me mention Traveler a lot in this conversation. Traveler did this by making you you know, muster into a military service like the Navy and then roll these dice. You could die in character creation. Everyone remembers all that business. The goal of that was that they, the thing that Mark Miller had a long time ago is the characters don't start off as untrained idiot 18-year-olds. <laughs> so in this situation, um, you still can start off as a young character that's only level one. Your age is really up to you, what your background is, but they want to give you an opportunity to have perfected a few things. You may already have kind of a natural talent. In the modern world, young people have tremendous amounts of natural talent because they're refining their skills at a much earlier age than they were when I was growing up. 18-year-olds when I was growing up, could maybe play sandlot football and that's about it, right? No driving skills, no drinking skills, or any of that kind of stuff. So the the proficiency bonus system is really, really interesting. It looks to me, the initial glance, like that is going to be a really interesting way to connect all the mechanics throughout the whole game, as long as you initially can keep track of them. So the building the character the first time is going to be very important for you not to miss out on any of these type of proficiency bonuses you're going to get, and be very careful about reading all the different feats and skills you pick up in the different packages you have, so you give yourself a fair shake, because you know a plus two proficiency bonus, if it's two numbers on a d20, that's 10%. So even though the numbers are going to go beyond the D20 mark, um, probably way up into 30s and 40s and things like that, just like in 3.5 did, um, that's really, really important. Now, another element that's interesting is in, they've kind of, you've heard people say it's kind of like three action economy. You'll hear that buzzword. It's a new buzzword that's happened in less than a week, a three action economy. What do they mean by that? So essentially, the way I understand it so far on day one, all right, is that when you're in a combat situation, you get three things you can do, three actions. And it might be, a co and, and some classes may have like an action where, oh, I can charge for only the cost of one action, and then I can do two melee swings. There's all kinds of interesting rules around it. So once the initiative has happened, the whole rounds uh, thing has gone right back to the six second segment type of a deal from a long time ago. Um, everyone gets a turn. So in Pathfinder, a turn isn't, 10 minutes like in AD and D it just means your turn like playing cards okay you play a monopoly hey dude it's your turn so the uh, encounter system uses this uh, kind of three action um, economy is what people were calling it and sometimes you'll get what's called a free action so you can do things uh, when it, so it's your turn to do something like say you're playing illusionist or something um, you get up to three things you can do. And it can be something, I mean, the description they get here is fantastic, right? You can use something simple like drawing a weapon or moving a short distance or opening a door. Like I open a door and take two steps forward and swing my sword attack twice. It might be something like that, which feels like a moment in time in a film or a good, solid, strong sentence in a book. So almost think of it as the, the actions is what three things can you do relatively quickly it can't be like i begin casting a spell let me just sit around for the four minutes while everything else gets resolved you actually get the opportunity to move or disengage or to do mundane things like drop the torch on the ground which costs like nothing or pull out a weapon that you didn't have the weapon ready so the characters are able to kind of get in and get out of combat scenarios and called encounters what they call it or combat scenarios essentially if you're not doing exploration or downtime you're doing an encounter and basically encounter is combat right so exploration and downtime is very, very different than what you might think. You can actually be doing things and advance your character during downtime, okay? So they're going back to this three-action thing. There's lots of different things in the game that are probably going to affect this, like something costs two, something costs one, something costs a lot. They have a new word they're kind of coining called a strike. And I haven't read far enough ahead yet to tell you I'm a master at the rule system yet. But the whole basic idea of trying to beat someone's armor class is still alive after all these years, right? Let's just get this stupid Adobe thing out of the way. Um, you know, they're calling it a strike. Whether it's a spell or whether it's a melee attack or whatever it is, um, you're kind of doing what's called like a difficulty check yet again. We're trying to beat a number, someone else's armor class, which is kind of, you know, thematically defining how hard it is to hit that person or how hard it is for your spell to land on them, things like that. So. It's really kind of like a task system in many ways. I think Mega Traveler used a task system to some degree. It was like eight or higher on two six-sided dice. 
So when you're playing the game, your character, your class, and all the other elements that help define um, what your character is all about, your ancestries, your backgrounds, the feats you pick, the skills you pick, they're all going to kind of modify these things to let you tailor a character that's the way you want them to be. And that was one thing I found to be very entertaining when they were kind of building this jokey character for the Zachary fella in the audience. They made him like a goblin bard or whatever who was a street urchin. It was hilarious. And uh, they, the, the level of personality that you as a player will be able to put into creating the character, to me, looks really, really interesting. And it also has a way for you to kind of just pick from a list. So instead of having to... Uh, um, roll a massive table and be randomly assigned that you were once a farmhand but you were ousted by your family and had to go live on your own and you became a loner hunter. You know, these weird kind of random tables that people create. It looks to me like what they've done is they kind of created packages for you to choose from that are interesting. I'm for sure the OGL community will start releasing tons and tons of these um, types of things pretty, pretty quickly. Ancestries and Backgrounds is a really interesting way to add flavor to the characters. So I see that as being a really interesting plus. I can't wait to start building some characters and see what's there. Um, one of my goals is to take the seven from the classic DM episodes and setting Hill Giant Chief and the Glacier of the Frost Giant Jarl. I'm, I'm using them as NPCs in the Black Ship of the Sunless, so I'm going to have to recreate those characters in second edition of Pathfinder, and it'll be neat to see how those packages and backgrounds line up with the previous backgrounds and storyline I wrote for those characters coming from Greyhawk, because I want to basically just lift them out of the AD&D world and drop them down into, P into Pathfinder 2E and see how they work out, and are they more robust, are they more interesting, because I had to create a lot on my own in the classic DM show to make those characters interesting and compelling. The game system didn't give me any of that because it's the first generation of it. But in this game system, it'll be a neat test to see how that pans out. Another element that's going to be interesting to see is that the good old-fashioned uh, reflex fortitude willpower saves are still there. Well, not willpower, but will saves. So that's great. I like that. I play a lot of Neverwinter, um, Neverwinter Nights. If you played any 3.5 game or any 3.0, that was a real simple way for you to see how you did saving throws. The concept is exactly the same. It really hasn't changed much. There's another element I want to mention too, is the whole multiple attack penalty type thing. Um, this is a situation where like, you say someone's running forward to take a swing at someone. Uh, let's just say this illusion this is a bad caster. And we're going to get this, uh, Vern Jar's running up to attack her and he's maybe he takes a, a five step step and then he can attack twice. Right? So every time you do a consecutive attack, the first attack, if you're already in range, it's just a regular attack. There's probably efficiency bonus that's involved. You're trying to beat the D, the AC number. Some classes are going to have an automatic kind of reaction to that that's free. Um, like, for example, you'll see later on in the book, you start reading through it, that some of the roguelike classes or the finesse-oriented type classes get a chance to like dodge out of the way or save versus being struck at all. You'll see that in the walkthrough of the playthrough. But they've added this multiple attack penalty. I actually think this is really interesting because if I'm guessing right this means we don't we aren't gonna have a series of excessively complex rules for dual wielding or for how many attacks per melee round and that's one thing in ad and d that was really tricky once i read it and find out more details it'll be neat to see how that pans out that's one thing that's all the way over the years has been tricky um for a long time it's like oh your main hand does this your off hand has this penalty no matter what your number of attacks per melee round is con is based upon your levels. You can do two attacks every three rounds. Divide that up however you want. In this situation, you have someone saying, well, you know what, I'm going to take their two-handed, you're going to take your black axe, and you're just going to strike three times rapidly to try to kill this thing from killing our friend. So, you know, you have the first attack based upon all of the factors as a regular armor class DC check, basically trying to beat the IC number. The second one, you get this automatic minus five penalty on the subsequent attack. And the third one's going to get minus 10. You know, I really like that. It's really easy to remember five and 10. Everything's in half. Really simple. The whole unit system, it's not one quarter inch equals one foot like we use in architecture. It's one foot, one inch equals five feet. So everything is going to be very, very easy for people to remember. Obviously, uh, hit points is still there, and that's a big health thing. The one thing I'm very excited about is the conditions system. So if you played Guild Wars 2, um, you probably remember how many conditions there were. A majority of PvP in that game, or World v. World, was uh, builds were built upon neutralizing, removing, or uh, stacking conditions on other players and all the enemies in the game also use the same types of thing. You can even see in their basic walkthrough type scenario where they have a, a party is fighting a ghast and someone gets like a condition put on them, puts a permanent penalty. They've created some condition cards you can just hand to someone, which I think is a really good idea. Okay, you got this condition on you for a period of time. 
the thing that you do about that's really interesting is you get a chance to save against that every melee rounds every six seconds that's brilliant none of this like oh the duration is, th is three melee rounds oh in the old days three melee rounds was three minutes three minutes of paralyzation we were playing Baldur's Gate 2 you know how nasty whole person was right so I like that kind of quicker faster more heroic shrug it off get hit get knocked unconscious get back up make the next saving throw keep going we call it heart in the UFC right so I really, really, really like that. I think it gives players a good chance to um, build their characters to either get out of the situations better, or even characters that aren't designed to do these kinds of things, a chance to do that to do something much more interesting too. So the next section of this whole introduction, it just has a bunch of key terms. I actually think it's really important to do that up front. A lot of games don't do that. They just go through everything you need to know. Ability score, alignment, ancestry, armor class, attack, currency, feat, condition. So they need to do this because they are introducing some new words. Let's just look at condition real quick. An ongoing effect that changes how a character can act, that alters some of their statistics, is called a condition. The rules for the basic conditions used in the game can be found in the conditions appendix in the back of the book. So in the back of the book, there will obviously be a huge, massive section about, about all the different conditions and what they can happen to you and all that kind of stuff. So these are kind of like status effects or things like that that are probably applied to you. As we look into it, we'll find out how some conditions are you know, going to do consistent damage over time. You could be doomed, dazzled, deafened, clumsy, concealed, confused, enfeebled, fascinated, encumbered, dying, hidden, hostile, immobilized, indifferent, petrified, prone. I mean, that's a lot of conditions. I think those kinds of things are neat because it'll generate a consistent language that people will understand um, about. Let's just pull to it. I got the PDF. Let's just look at it. We'll be able to, these are consistent things. You could build a new monster and build a new series of conditions, right, that work for that situation. Let's just drop this down. Every time I change a page in the PDF, it wants to resize everything. We'll put this at 65 real quick. So the condition system, I think, is really interesting because it now creates a unified language for debuffs, okay? So these types of things, I think, are really cool. It gives them a very short, brief descriptions when things are really tricky like let's just look up unconscious i mean when you try to explain to someone how you're going to do someone's unconscious there you go there it is unconscious so you got like almost a full half column to explain explain unconscious but if you told someone yeah man we were doing really good but i was quicken when my another person in my party was restrained and two guys were, were sickened and stupefied it sounds kind of silly but those are actually conditions so you can gain and lose these types of things over time so and there's some of them be, are even considered uh, redundant I really like this. I like this because as a game designer, when we're, tr we're creating a massive multiplayer game, we have to code all this stuff. And when, you know, even in World of Warcraft, you've got stuns and mezzes and things like that. When you're having to create a lot of conditions, they require a lot of code. There are a lot of ways for people to have saves against them. People have resistances against them in EverQuest and EverQuest 2. There's a lot of different uh, MMOs that have conditions that are applied to people. You're snared, you're rooted, you're stunned, you're paralyzed, you're knocked down, you're stood up. You play Warhammer Online, you know about this stuff. So for me, um, having these in here, although for me as a, as a video game designer, I'm excited about it because it's kind of video game-ish, but it's now immediately creating a language for things that are really going to be debuffs in the game. So when you see a monster later on and a monster can you know, do something to you, um, you'll be able to look it up. But at the same time, you have things like, and what's this one up here in the upper hand corner? Observed? Like, let's just look at that real quick. What are we on? A? Deaf and doom, drain, observed. Anything in plain view is observed by you. If a creature takes measure to avoid detection, such as using stealth or, hi or hide, they can become hidden or undetected instead of observed. If you have another precise sense instead or in addition to sight, you might be able to observe a creature or object using that sense instead. You can observe a creature only with precise senses. When seeking, which probably has ability in here, um, a creature using only imprecise senses, it remains hidden rather than observed. So that's kind of a... It's, it's, it's general enough for you to apply it to a plethora of interesting situations uh, without being just one specific rule for one specific situation that doesn't make any sense at all. And the names are great. The names immediately pique your interest. So I found that idea of having the conditions and stuff to be absolutely fantastic. Let's go back to where we were. So we're looking at, uh, they have all these key terms. I think it's really important to go through those to read them. And what the problem is, you're going to start reading them quickly. Like, oh yeah, bonuses and penalties and initiative and levels. I know all that. But you really need to read through every single one of them because things like rarity and proficiency are very different. Um, how What is speed and opposed to movement and things like that are very different. So it's really good this is all up front. They have an example play, and I won't read it to you. 
but I actually want to give them some accolades on the on the example of play. There's some there's some funny things about the way this was written. I thought was kind of interesting. They give a really really strong example of play of three characters kind of going into this tomb and encountering a gas and get into a fight. It's written in an interesting way. It's written it's written in a way where the players are very excited about what they're about to do, and the DM is describing things to them to pique their interest. And he's not prompting them what to do, but he's describing the actions of the enemy in a very believable, theatrical way. He's not role-playing it or anything. And the characters, the players playing the game are getting roped and pulled in. And so this is kind of like a really, really good way for you to get someone who's never played D&D, never played any kind of game, read through this to kind of understand what this is like. Because when you watch people online playing on web cameras, it doesn't. It isn't like that. When you play at a table with real people face to face, and you're having a good time, this is the kind of back and forth you want to have happen. So I'm really, really glad they put this in here because this is what playing uh, tabletop role playing games is really, really like. It's not like these very dramatic goofball kind of fun shows. Those things are fun. Some people like them. Some people really like them. They're entertaining. They're like watching a reality show. You watch people with voice actors and all this kind of stuff. I have nothing against that. I think it's fun. But. The thing that's really cool about this is not only is it broken down by Eric, Liz, and Judy, Eric, Liz, James, and Judy, all their actions, there's elements in italics in here they are in this uh, burgundy font they like to use, burgundy colored font that kind of explains what the DM does. So even if you're reading this and you're a DM, you can see, you know, when they're doing the initiative, why one numbers were different, because all the rules are right. This isn't like a dumb scenario. This is an actually legitimate scenario. Explain you by the time you get done reading this uh, situation, you'll learn about paralyzed and sudden charge. Um, you'll see how the fortitude save works. You'll see how the AC works. You'll see a, a penalty for range measures for throwing daggers. Um, you see the DM rolling behind the screens to figure out how things happen. This is just in two pages. This thing is really, really strong, really good. And this is, goes back to my previous comment about things being concise, unlike me, that this is really, really strongly done. I'm really, really happy about it. Now, we talked about the actions earlier, and I, I don't want to go too far, but every one of these books in the world, they have one of these, like, how to use this book type thing, right? And I think they're really important to see those things, because when you have something like this in the upper right-hand corner, notice right off the bat, single action, two action, three action, reaction, and free action. So... That's a great way with iconography to take a look at something and when you get an ability in the game and say, hey, listen, this is how long, this is what this is going to be. For example, let's just, Bless is on page, what is it, 381. Bless has two of these two, act, these has two little pips here. Okay, these aren't two Rubik's Cubes and they're side with one piece falling off. This is a single cost. It's like a chip, right? This is a two action activity. So casting bless, somatic and verbal, somatic and ver verbal means speaking holy words, and somatic means doing your hands around in the air. You probably heard, used to be VSM, a material component. That's gone now. So you know, the cleric says, I'm going to cast bless. I got three actions in my turn. I could take a few steps back and then start casting bless. And at the end of the next round, maybe at the end of their turn, maybe it'll be dumped on the whole party. And the whole party gets the one minute duration buff, right? So that to me is really, really, really interesting. The other thing I noticed is right off the bat is they changed, uh, they call these things traditions for some of these spells, whether it's divine or occult and things like that. Instead of just being, these are just spells for the illusionists. They now have categories to them. I thought that was really, really, really smart. So by putting this in this section here, you see right away, besides some of the basic two-page descriptions of, you know, what's going to happen in the game, what's it play like, what are some of the words, what are some of the new concepts, two pages for the new concepts, right? If you never played a game before, here's how it plays. It's all about creating an interactive narrative. Two pages to tell you what's pretty much new and what's cool and why it works. Two pages to give you some of the key words you need to learn two pages to give you a really cool example to get you excited about it and then tell you what's in the cool book what chapter is going to get you excited right away so these are the breakdowns of the chapters introduction ancestry backgrounds classes skills feeds equipment appendices etc so before you got to page what is this 17 and the first four or five pages of the book are always i don't even count the, the the real beat starts at page seven so in 10 pages this game already has me totally excited the reaction system, I think, is really interesting. If you've ever done any fencing or ever done any martial arts, we know how much a punch and a counter punch or a kick and a drop kick is going to be. We know what leg kicks are like. We know when people would flinch from a feint. When you're having real actual combat with people, these things take time. When you're going to do something in a D&D game, the tactical element of the single action, two action, and three action is very interesting for someone to try to say, hmm, I got three actions. What can I do? It's like, how many combo points do you have built up? How much mana do you have to burn? Um, 
you know, what can you do in a certain amount of time? For, is something on cooldown? No, it's not cooldown oriented anymore. It's more about being able to balance out your actions. So be able to do, take a step, open a door, pull something out of your bag, you know, touch someone, unsheathe a weapon, throw it to a comrade, then take a step and cast a spell. Those are interesting creative actions for the player. So that element in of itself is going to be where a lot of the questions are going to happen. I can see people already a month from now asking, hey guys, I got this situation where my party's fighting a vampire and the cleric wanted to do A, um, but I thought that the rogue could do B. And do you think this is a reaction or a reaction or should they get a free action for this? And that's when you're going to get into these little grimy little details that are going to happen when people are very, very hardcore into rules in Pathfinder. And one thing I'm going to make myself do is not change anything. That's one thing I did a lot with AD&D because it needed a lot more added to it. But with this, I trust these guys. This stuff has been worked out and play tested. I'm really, really happy with what they've done here. Um, of course, the core ability scores are still there. The core ability scores have always been there. That's never going to change. And, you know, and after that, it just goes right into let's make a character, come with a concept, and let's talk about the classes real quick, right? What do you get to do? What are you going to get to build from these days? There you go. They have these ancestries. Right? So you have dwarf, elf, gnome, goblin, halfling, human. Then you have these classes, alchemist, barbarian, bard, champion, the classes across the bottom and the, uh, the um, ancestries across the top. Um, and then on the right-hand page, you have cleric, druid, fighter, monk, ranger, rogue, sorcerer, and wizard. That's fantastic. In D&D, there was fighter, ranger, paladin, thief, assassin, magic user, cleric, and illusionist, and monk. So there was, there was basically nine in this situation, the alchemist kind of reminds me of Guild Wars 2. Brand new. Barbarian, that's from 3. Bard, that's been around forever. Champion, kind of sounds like a paladin. Cleric's been there forever. This girl's got a sword in her hand. Druid's been around forever. Fighter's been around forever. Thank God the monk is here. I love monks. Ranger's here. Rogue, that's basically thief, assassin. Sorcerer, that's from 3.5. And wizard, which is basically a magic user. So, But the ancestries, so we notice how there's no half orcs or there's no drow sun elves or anything like that it's dwarf elf gnome halfling and human is there anything missing do you see anything missing imagine how many of the subsets of the ancestries there's going to be there'll be an entire chapter that's going to go into describing all the different um ancestries and how they work and i'm going on a little bit too long here. My initial reaction to everything is I really like how this is organized. I like some of the pure, simple, interesting new concepts. I could see myself having a lot of fun creating characters. I could see combat working really, really cleanly. I can't wait to actually play it and give some feedback on what it's like to really play it. The one thing I will have to say is that the, how thoughtful and clean and beautiful that everything has been put together and how well written all the content is has probably impressed me the most. It's been a long time coming for someone to come up with another version of D&D &D, essentially through the OGL. And I'm so proud of what the guys have done at Pathfinder. This is not even endorsed. I just love what they've done. The only reason why I like it is because they did something cool. I don't even know these folks personally at all. So I think overall you definitely should grab the PDF at a minimum and just start going through it. There'll be online resources for how to build a character. They go through step-by-step step what you should do to build a character. I mean, you know, picking a background, choosing the class, the way you do the, the, the ability scores is a lot different now. A lot more things allow you to get bonuses to apply to any um, ability score as opposed to just like rolling the dice and moving the mice type deal anymore. You have to calculate all the modifiers. Um, they built a character today in probably like 20 minutes, except there was conversation happening with the crowd. Then you have skills. So, you know, they even did a sample character for you, which is, can be quite confusing if never no one's ever done it before in a game like this. So overall, you know, in the first 10 to 12 pages, um, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Really excited about this. Totally can't wait. And uh, gosh, if any of you know a place that has an online character builder that doesn't have some $35 uh, subscription cost, uh, let me know because I would just love to sit down one day and build a thousand characters because even just doing that sounds like a lot of fun. All right, so let's wrap it up. So this is just day one. Books got here at 1230. It's 5.50 in the afternoon. I've been going on like an excited child for 30 minutes. Hope it gives you a good snip of what the game looks like, what the the things that excited me about it, my initial thoughts. I'm going to play it. I'm going to dig through it. I'm going to do characters. I'm going to do a lot more content. Um, and I just can't wait to see what happens. If you're not a member of one of the Facebook groups, I recently joined one. There's a, there's a Pathfinder um, Facebook group. Let me just look at my phone here real quick and see if I can, see if I can figure out what the name of it is. 
I think it's a Pathfinder fan group or whatever. You should come join that one. I definitely, I definitely encourage you to join. It's called the, um, it's called the Pathfinder 2E Fan Dash Group. You should join that one. If you can suggest one that other people are in, uh, come jump in there too. So far, the tone of the people in that group is really, really cool. Um, I'm really excited about that, and it's going to be so fun to have something brand new to dig into. God knows there'll be a huge Christmas list for this fall, right? And I uh, hope you have a lot of fun with it. If you have any questions or comments or something you want to see happen, uh, definitely let me know. Uh, I have a huge list of things I want to do with this already, and I just talk about the book on the first day. And uh, that's pretty much it. We'll talk to you later and have a, you know, congratulations to Paizo for an awesome launch. I'm very impressed, and I hope that Gen Con goes amazingly well. And I haven't even talked about the base Jerry. <laughs> so let's dig into the rules over the next four or five days, hardcore. I'm going to roll some characters, play some combat situations, and see what it feels like playing. Because I know that's the feedback they asked for today. Yes, you can talk about the book. That's great. What they really want to know is what you think about what it's like to play it. And I'm going to do everything I can to try to give them good, solid feedback. I'd love to know what you think, too. What do you find interesting about it? What do you not like about it? So, and then we'll just leave it at that. Hope you enjoyed this initial thoughts video from me, Classic DM. And uh, keep your eyes peeled. We'll do lots more cool stuff soon. Take care.